I'm so glad that God doesn't dole his love out. Aren't you glad that God doesn't just dole his love out penny by penny by penny? Say, God, do you love me? I said, well, here's a little bit. God, do you care for me? Okay, well, here's a little care. I'm glad God is not cautious with his love. He is extravagant. Amen. He's extravagant. He is the God of a thousand times more than you've ever dared to think of or imagine. Amen. I love that line in that course where he says, uh, fresh oil. I, I was the president of a university in Oklahoma and I came across a situation where the, the, out in the parking lot, some of the uh, security guards were helping this girl with her car and everything like that. And she said I, to me, she said, President Rutland, I don't, I don't know what's happened to it. I don't know. She said, I'm always keep gas in it. I always keep gas in it. And I said, do you change the oil? And she said, oil? The security guards looked at me and they nod their heads. I said, tow it in, boys. It's, it's gone. You know, I think we do that to God sometimes. God says, I want to give you fresh oil. And we say, oil? <laughs> the best car in the most expensive garage in the greatest country in the world occasionally needs fresh oil. Why don't you lift your hands up and ask him for it? Heavenly Father, we ask you, pour fresh oil upon us tonight. Come Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you that you're a God of generosity and abundance and extravagance and that you don't dole it out to us drop by drop by drop, but that you pour it on us in a deluge. Come Holy Spirit. We thank you for it. We thank you. I thank you for those who have come in their numbers on this midweek service. Bless them, O Lord, and may they leave here tonight saying, I know that the Lord has visited us. In the mighty name, Jesus, the strong Son of God. Amen, amen, and amen. Well, magnify the Lord in the house. Go on and praise His holy name. Praise God. Praise God, praise God, praise God. And you can be seated. I'm looking forward to being with the Wisdom Club on Friday. There's only, only about uh, four dozen places open. You're gonna have to sign up tonight. I'm gonna be speaking. That, uh, I don't know that you will learn anything, gain anything, benefit in any way, but we're gonna laugh our fool heads off. I'm gonna be speaking on joy for the journey. So I hope that you'll be here and that we're gonna have a great time. I've been with the Wisdom Club several times. I'm gonna tell you something about these people. What happens at the Wisdom Club st stays at the Wisdom Club, and it better, too. I've seen many times when Jensen's mother was just praying, oh, Lord, don't let the pastor come today. <laughs> we have a great time. It's going to be fun. Well, I, I um, am so glad to be back. I want to tell you that I have a, a, an announcement to make. I have a brand new book that is finished. Uh, I, I waited uh, about 15 years. I waited about 15 years to write this book. I compiled material and uh, researched and worked on it. And uh, this is a book about uh, inner healing, uh, about the healing from things that haunt us and attack us and that we have to fight off and deal with. Uh, and, it's, and it's everybody. Uh, somebody said one time, everybody is getting well from something. And, uh, and so uh, Jensen has invited me very generously to present this book. It'll be the, the Atlanta and National, as a matter of fact, premiere will be uh, Sunday, September the 1st. That's the Labor Day weekend Sunday. And that book will be here and I'll be preaching on courage to be healed. I hope that you'll be here. I hope that you will bring somebody with you and uh, buy a thousand books each. Don't laugh when I say that. We'll have a great time. September the 1st, I hope you'll be here and uh, we're going to have a, a great, great time. I'll, I'll sign, you buy a thousand, I'll sign them all. And my hand, somebody said, does your hand ever get tired of signing books? I said, never, never. My hand gets tired of signing checks. It'll, sometimes it'll cramp up till I can't hold the pen. It's a, all right. You have your Bibles. If you'll take those and turn tonight to Numbers chapter, 15, Numbers chapter 11, verse 5. I want to read. I want to commit 
homiletical Harry Carey tonight. I'm going to read one verse of scripture and preach on three others. But I want to speak tonight on being healed from the toxin of self-pity. I've come to believe that self-pity is one of the most poisonous toxins in the human experience. Numbers chapter 11 and verse 5. These are the Hebrews in the wilderness and they are remembering the food that they ate in Egypt. I just want you to listen how they remember all these things and just say good food. Listen, look at the grocery list here. It's an amazing verse of scripture. We remember the fish which we didn't eat in Egypt freely. The cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. We did eat. Now, there's one verse, one word in the verse. Did you see it? Did you see it? That we did eat freely. No. They were slaves. They were slaves. In other words, they have completely twisted the reality of what things were. And it causes them to bring a judgment on what things are. Look at the next verse. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. In other words, they cannot enjoy manna, which they can eat freely, for imagining all the stuff they ate in Egypt as slaves. When I, uh, I pastored my very first church, I was um, 22 years old. President Lincoln was in the White House. I remember. <laughs> it's so rude to laugh at me. Um, and uh, I was 22, a Methodist minister. The, the bishop of the North Georgia Conference sent me to pastor a church in the foothills of the Blue Ridge. A 22-year-old boy ought not to be given a driver's license, let alone a church. Um, but I learned more in that little tiny country Methodist church than I probably learned in six or seven years of postgraduate education, including a PhD. Two ladies taught me a great deal. They were elderly widows who were sisters with the uh, memorable names of Miss Ethel and Miss Mabel. Miss Mabel had married um, a wealthy man who left, when he died, left her wealthy. She had inherited a great deal of money from him and he had a substantial life insurance policy. She lived in a beautiful home, drove a luxury car and had absolutely no problems financially. And she was one of the angriest, meanest, most miserable human beings I've ever met in my life. I came to the place where when I showed up in church and I saw Miss Mabel coming in the door, I tried to hide. <laughs> I, I've just never met anybody that was as angry and bitter. Her sister, who was also a widow, was two years older. Ethel was two years older than Mabel. She had been married to a man that drove a pulpwood truck and he had been killed in a horrible accident. A winch had come loose and dropped a load of logs on him and crushed him to death. And of course he left her nothing and he never had an insurance policy in his life. Now she lived on a government dole in the public housing unit in a nearby city, which was frankly dangerous. But she was the most joyful lady I've ever known in my life. When, when Ethel came to church, it felt like Jesus had showed up. Her little hands were twisted up with arthritis. She couldn't hold a pencil as far as I could tell. Whenever I'd see Miss Mabel, I'd say, dreading the answer, how are you, Miss Mabel? Oh, horrible. Horrible. How are you, Miss Ethel? How are you? Oh, she'd say, isn't it a beautiful day? I went down to, uh, I did everything I could do to avoid Miss Mabel, but I went down to see Miss Ethel at the public housing unit where she lived. 
And I knocked on the door of her little apartment. She didn't answer. And sometimes she sat on what she called the back porch, which was no kind of a back porch. It was a little concrete pad on the back door. And sometimes she sat around there. So I went around behind to see her. I I came around the end of the building and I could hear her singing. She was sitting on the back porch. She had a big pan on her lap and she was popping beans. And every, every time she popped one of those beans open, she winced with her little twisted fingers, the pain of that arthritis, popping those beans open. But I could hear her singing, count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God has done. Brought tears to my eyes. Standing there watching this poor little widow lady with nothing she didn't have, two nickels to rub together, singing count your many blessings. And I I got teary. So finally I went around there and I said, Miss Ethel, It's the pastor. Oh, she said, I'm so glad to see you. Come and sit with me on the porch. (laughs) The porch didn't have even room for two chairs. So I sat on the edge of the concrete there and I said, Miss Ethel, I want to ask you a question. I, I want you to answer me. I said, I heard you singing. Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. I said, tell me one of your blessings. What are you happy about today? Oh, she said, the little girl in the apartment over me had a baby and her husband is gone to the hospital to see the new baby and God has helped me to fix their supper tonight and I'm so grateful. And I thought to myself, here her sister lives in a beautiful house, drives a luxury automobile, and as far as I can tell, is in excellent health. And this lady hadn't got anything. And rejoicing in the Lord because God has given her the power in her painful little fingers to pop beans for the the apartment that lives on top of her in a public housing unit. And it came to me right that moment. The toxin of self-pity is lethal to the human spirit. Not only that, it's lethal to the spirits around us. Now I'm going to give you three examples from scripture of people that struggled with this sin of self-pity. Now before I do that, let me just say this to you. The problem with all sin is that sin is never isolated. One sin gives way to another. You let let the devil in the back seat and pretty soon he's fighting for control of the wheel. But, But one sin always bleeds over into another. And the sin of self pity often leads to other sins. The sin of self pity doesn't, doesn't seem all that wicked, but it can lead to some really serious stuff. It is wicked, but it doesn't seem as nothing. You don't see somebody like Miss Mabel who marinated in self-pity and you don't look at her and think the same way you do as if you see some, some poor, you know, drug addict stumbling down the street with vomit dried on his shirt. You say, oh, look at that poor, terrible sinner. Look at the shape he's in. But then you look at Miss Mabel in her luxury car and I'm not, I'm not preaching against luxury cars. I'm really happy to have the one I have. <laughs> it's not that. It is that it's very difficult to see her and feel the same level of, of horror as we see with that, with that drug addict. But the fact of the matter is, it's a, it's a pretty wicked sin. But the worst thing about it is that like all sins, It causes other sins. So having said all that, the first example I want to give you is going to surprise you. It's the prophet Elijah. From 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah has just been used mightily of God, supernaturally. He has prayed and God sealed up the heavens, stopped the rain at his prayer. He prays yet again. You remember in 1 Kings chapter 19, he brings the 450 false prophets and 400 priests of Baal to Mount Carmel. He confronts the wicked king Ahab. 
and he prays down fire. You remember the fire comes, it burns the sin-soaked sacrifice. It burns the stones, it burns the water, it leaps into the trench and burns it like Mexican oil. He prays down fire. He prays to stop the heaven and it stops raining. He prays down fire. And then he turns to Ahab and he says, now get in your chariot and head back to the capital city because it's about to rain. You remember he prays again, the, the cloud the size of a man's hand. And he says, now get in your chariot and go. It's going to rain and it's going to rain so much that the wheels of your chariot will get stuck in the mud in the valley of Jezreel. And then he tucks his robe up and outruns the horse-drawn chariot. So he has sealed up heaven with a prayer, prayed down fire, defeated 850 false prophets of a false god, prayed for a rainstorm and outrun a chariot. You just think to yourself, this guy must be courageous. And then Ahab's wife Jezebel sends him an email. Just about a four line email. You killed my priests. You killed, you killed my priests. May the gods who they worship do so unto me if I don't kill you before the sun comes up. And Elijah, who has prayed down fire and outrun a chariot, is afraid of a woman. <laughs> Actually, so far, uh, that makes sense. No, <laughs> no, no. It says, the next verse says, he goes all the way to Beersheba. I don't know if you've been to, I've been to Israel 38 times and I can tell you that what happens in Jezreel, Mount Carmel, is in the north of Israel, Beersheba is well south of Jerusalem in the desert near to the, to the Dead Sea. He goes as far, we always say this, from Dan to Beersheba, he goes as far south as he can to get away from this woman and hunkers down in a cave, leaves his servants, says, stay here. He goes on into the desert, finds a cave, hunkers down in the mouth of the cave, and he says, just kill me. He prays, it'd, just be, it'd be better if I could just die. Isn't that amazing? The prophet of God and the supernatural anointing of the Holy Spirit one day and the next day feeling so sorry for himself that he wishes he could die. Self-pity is, is disarming. It steals our strength. It steals our courage. It robs us of our boldness. Why didn't he send an email back to Jezebel? Come and get me. I'm right here on Mount Carmel. I'm not leaving. The blood of your prophets is still flowing in the creek at my feet. I'm right here. Instead, he says, oh God, I wish I was dead. Isn't it amazing that God can touch us, anoint us, empower us, use us to do miraculous things one minute and that very next minute, we're feeling so sorry for ourselves that we're all alone in a cave praying to die. It just, it is so like us that I'm shocked to see it in the life of the great prophet. But that's not the end of it. Remember what I said? The sin of self-pity can lead to other sins. Then he says, not once, but twice to God, I'm the only one you've got left. I'm the only prophet left in Israel. I'm the only one who loves you. I'm the only one who serves you. Everybody else is dead. I'm the only one. The sin of self-pity can lead to the even worse sin of self-righteousness. When you begin to feel sorry for yourself, you can then convince yourself that you alone are right and nobody else is. That you alone are serving God and nobody else is. That you alone are the only one left alive until finally God scolds him and says, listen, I'd just like to point out to you that I have kept 7,000 other prophets alive. You're not the only one. And I just want to say this to you. 
If you have begun to think you're the only one serving God, you're the only one living right, you're the only one doing right, the only one in your family, the only one in this city, it is because somehow or another self-pity in your life has bled over into self-righteousness. That's, that's one of the things I've always appreciated so much about Free Chapel and about Jensen. I love Jensen. I love what he's doing. This is great. I mean, this is wonderful. But I have never had one whiff come from Jensen that he thinks he's the only person doing anything in the kingdom. I just saw an interview with Jensen. I just saw it. He said, when I was young, I kind of struggled a little bit with com competitiveness. But he said, the older I get, he said, I, I want to see you succeed. He said, the older I get, I rejoice in other people's, other people's victories, other people's successes. I, I believe that the toxin of self-pity bleeding over into the even more toxic poison of self-righteousness can isolate us from the work that God has for us. God had a supernatural ministry for Elijah and self-pity and fear and self-righteousness had him holed up in a cave. God has work for you to do and he cannot accomplish that work if you're laying in your bed feeling sorry for yourself and feeling like you're the only one in this thing that's right. Now, I don't want you to think this is all just diagnostic. We're going to come to, what do we do? What do we do? But let's, let's deal with the toxin first. And then I want to know, what, what, how do I treat it? But let's deal with the toxin first. Here's the second one. 1 Kings chapter 21, the wicked King Ahab. Now let's deal with him. Elijah's gone. The priests have all been killed on Mount Carmel. Ahab, this wicked king, the husband of an even wickeder queen, Jezebel, he, he looks out of his window and there's a man there, Nabot, we say in, he, in English, Naboth. He has a vineyard that is very near to the palace. And he says to the guy, look, this is so close to my kitchen. I'd like to buy this and turn it into, a, I'm going to rip up all your vineyards and turn it into an herb garden because it's close to my kitchen. And the guy says, which he should say, an appropriate uh, uh, answer, uh, according to ancient Hebrew law, he says, this is what I've inherited from my father. So you can buy and trade in ancillary properties, but that core inheritance that's passed down father to son to father to son to father to son, you can't, you're not supposed to sell that. And he says, this, this is the core inheritance of my family. God forbid that I would sell it to you. And it says that Ahab, the king, goes into his bedroom, gets in his bed, puts his face to the wall, and won't eat. Isn't that a pretty picture? The king of Israel acting like a big fat baby laying in his bed. It's perfect. You know what I've found out? I've been married for more than 50 years, been in ministry for more than 50 years, been doing counseling for more than 50 years, and I have found that not only did I not understand who men and women are, I had them backwards. <laughs> I thought that women were sulkers. Women are not sulkers. Women are exploders. They will press it down, pack it down, push it down for a little while, and then when it's time to come out, it's Mount Vesuvius. It's volcanic. Not men. Men are not eruptors. Women are eruptors. Men are sulkers. Men are sulkers. The way home from the Sunday school party, she says to him, what's the matter? Nothing. No, something's wrong. I, I, I said something and I embarrassed you, didn't I? No, no, you didn't. Drive a little further. Baby, what's wrong? What's wrong? Is something the matter? Nothing's the matter. It will be if you go on with this. I mean, this is perfect, isn't it? This big fat baby feeling sorry for himself. The king of Israel because he can't get one thing that he wants. I believe that one of the wickedest spirits that is haunting the United States of America in this part of the 21st century is the spirit of entitlement. I'm entitled. He says, I'm the king. I'm entitled to this vineyard. I ought to own it. I deserve it. 
And when that is frustrated, it feeds a spirit of self-justified self-pity. Listen to me. If you ever once have said to yourself, I just want what's coming to me. Don't do that. I told you earlier, years ago, I was in the Methodist church and I, one year in the Methodist church in those days, we didn't, the church couldn't call the pastor they wanted. The bishop made the appointments and often you would go to Friday of annual conference and you didn't know where you were going. The bishop would read the appointments out Friday, Sunday, you preached in your own church and then you moved and the next Sunday you were in the new church. It was very stressful. As I went into annual conference one day, I met a lady in a church that I used to pastor. She said, Dr. Ellen, are, are you moving this year? I said, well, I'm moving, but I don't know where yet. The bishop hadn't read out the appointments. She said, oh, I hope you get the church you deserve. I said, oh, God, no. <laughs> I said, I've seen that church. <laughs> the spirit of entitlement feeds the spirit of self-pity. I deserve it. I want what's coming to me. It ought to be mine. And I deserve that man's vineyard. But that, as I told you, it doesn't stand alone. That spirit feeds other sins. The spirit of self-pity feeds, comes from selfishness, greed, and finally, it empowers the spirit of Jezebel. A sulking, self-pitying Ahab is the empowerment of a spirit of Jezebel. Jezebel now leads a conspiracy. She suborns perjury. She forges a letter, puts the king's seal on it, gets an innocent man murdered, gets him accused of, of blasphemy against God and sedition against the king, steals his property and gets it for him. When you begin to feel entitled to something and saturated in self-pity because you're not getting it, it makes you feel justified in doing anything that you ought to, that you want to do in order to get it because you deserve it. It can cause you to justify every kind of sin imaginable. Oh, it doesn't have to be killing an innocent man, but it can be killing an innocent reputation. It can be starting a gossip campaign against this woman over here because you deserve her husband. You feel like you ought to have her husband. You deserve her husband. What you don't know is she might be happy to give him to you. <laughs> Self-pity distorts our vision. We can't see anything right. We, we only, we feel entitled. We want what we want and it justify, makes us feel justified in doing anything that it takes to get it. The third one is from the book of Ruth. Of course, the book of Ruth is named for Ruth, this Moabitess Gentile girl. But the real deal in the book of Ruth through most of the book is Naomi, her Jewish mother-in-law. Naomi, um, there is a famine in Israel. She and her husband and her two grown sons leave Israel, go across the Jordan River into the country of Moab. There they experience momentary prosperity. They've avoided the problems that are in Israel. His, her sons get married. She's not all that happy about that. They marry Gentiles. She's not all that happy about it, but... She's married, there, she's married, she's prosperous, her husband is good, the sons are good, and she's got these two daughters-in-law that are Gentiles, but at least everything's okay. Until what? The famine that's in Israel catches up with them in Moab. Her husband dies, now she's a widow. Son number one dies, and son number two dies. Now she not only has no husband and no sons, she's got worse than nothing, she's got two Gentile daughters-in-law. So she says to him, I, I release you, go, go home. I, 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 according to Jewish law, you should stay with me till I can get married again, have a baby. That baby grows up. The first one should marry, have another baby. She says, I'm too old for that. I release you. One of the girls goes back. Ruth says, this wonderful speech, everybody in the room just about knows it. Whither thou goest, I will go. Whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people should be my people. Thy God should be my God. I've done weddings where the bride and groom said that to each other. That doesn't make any sense. 
That doesn't make any sense. You want to use it at a wedding, have the bride turn around and say it to her (laughs) mother-in-law. So Naomi goes back to Bethlehem. She's poor. She's broke. She's hungry. She's a widow. And she's got this Gentile daughter-in-law stuck to the bottom of her shoe like bubble gum. And the people of Bethlehem rush out. And, and she makes a play on her. It doesn't work in English, but it works in Hebrew. She makes a word play on her name. Her name in Hebrew, Naomi means full, but it means full of blessings. Full like we sang at the, for, in that last chorus. Abundance. Fullness. And so they, they rush out to her. They see her. It's a rhetorical question. If I, ha, if I haven't seen Pastor Tracy in a long time and I see him, I say, oh, Tracy, is that you? Well, I know it's Tracy. But that's a thing you say. Oh, is that you? They say, Naomi, is that you? She said, why do you call me Naomi? I used to be Naomi. I used to be full. Now I'm empty. I've got nothing. I've got less than nothing. I've got worse than nothing. And it's God's fault. She says, because the Almighty hath afflicted me. Therefore, call me not Naomi, full. Call me Merah, bitter. Myra in Hebrew means bitter, and it doesn't just mean bitter, it means bitter as in toxic, deadly. She says, I'm a bitter, angry, self-pitying old woman because God has done it to me. That's amazing, isn't it? The sin of self-pity brings Naomi to the sin of blaming God. But the story, thank God, doesn't end there. Ruth goes out to glean in the field. I don't know if you know what gleaning is, but in Hebrew law, it's, it's against the law for somebody harvesting their field to go right to the edges. You have to turn, leave the corners, and then once you've harvested a field, you can't go back and pick everything up. You have to leave it. The poor people all stand at the edge of the field waiting for your harvesters to go, and as soon as they go, they go in and get the rest. So Ruth goes, Naomi's too old to do gleaning in the sun. So Ruth goes, while she's there, a man pulls up and says, you you don't mean to be doing this. He says to the boys, give her some wheat, give her another bushel, give her five bushels, give her everything she wants. She goes home to Naomi and she says, look at this, look at all this. Naomi says, who did this? Well, this man, what man? She describes him. Naomi says, that's my kinsman, boys. That's my kinsman. He's so rich. Listen, baby, tomorrow when you go to the field, put some lipstick on. <laughs> Little eyeshadow wouldn't hurt you in it. <laughs> well, we all know the story. They fall in love and they get married. But do you realize this? Their child is named Obed. He gets married. And his child is named Jesse. And he gets married. And his child is David the king. And from that DNA comes Messiah Emmanuel, even Jesus. So what is the cure? What is the cure? It is this. It is that we see that God may be working something out beyond what I can see in this moment. God God is working out an eternal purpose. Ruth, this Gentile daughter-in-law that she didn't want and tried to get rid of, is listed in the genealogy of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. She's the great-great-grandmother of the greatest king Israel ever had. God's working something out. God may be doing something that you can't see. You may be wallowing in self-pity if you could just back up and say, God, do whatever you want to any way you want to. Years ago, I assumed the pastor leadership of a tough church. I'm not dissing it, it was just tough. It had been beat up and pastoral failures and scandal and everything else, and I went there and God gave us a great miracle, but it was tough. I'm just being honest. It was tough. It was tough on my family. It was tough on my kids. There were times when I couldn't let my children go out to the car lot, to the car in the car parking lot without me. I said, don't go tell daddy goes because I didn't want them to find the 
ugly notes that were under the windshield wipers. I couldn't let them answer the phone in the middle of the night when the phone rang because people cursing them. My little children. It was, uh, it was tough. So years later, my kids are all married. Everybody, we're at Thanksgiving dinner and everybody was there, grandkids, everybody. And I felt it was time for a mea culpa. So I said, all right, everybody, listen to me. I took this church. I felt God led me to it, but I, I want to tell you something. I feel like I made a mistake there. And I, if I hurt you and I cause this, I, I want you to forgive me. Will you forgive me? And our son, Travis, who's a wonderful pastor now and a great preacher, and he was sitting there, just a kid, a young, young, newlywed with two little boys. He looked up at me and he said, you know, dad, how come every story has to be about you? I said, I beg your pardon? He said, no, he said, every story, you, you are the hero of every story. If you're not the hero of every story, you're the villain of every story. He said, why does every story have to be about you? I said, son, that's tough. He said, well, I'm gonna ask you something. He said, if we hadn't gone to that church, I wouldn't have met Courtney, this little brown-eyed daughter-in-law that you love more than you love me. He said, I wouldn't have these little boys that you're spoiling rotten. Maybe God didn't send us to that church for you. Maybe he sent us to that church for me. I, 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 I can't speak for Brother Franklin. I can't, I can't put words in his mouth. But personally, I hate it when God speaks through members of my family. No, don't you see, God may be doing something in this situation that you can't see. Maybe it doesn't have anything to do with you. What if the toughest thing you've ever been through, maybe you're in a cave like Elijah, and God will say, in this cave, I'm working something out in you that will show up in a harvest in your great, great grandchild. The last thing is this. No matter what it is, it's so important. It's so basic. How do we miss it? We look at a situation and we evaluate who God is based on what we can see in the situation. So if this looks bad, God must be bad. That's what Naomi said. This is not just a bad thing in my life. The Almighty has afflicted me. She blamed God. The Almighty has afflicted me. I'm going to tell you something. All self-pity at its root is anger at God. I wouldn't have this husband if you were a better God. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have this situation. I wouldn't have lost my job. We wouldn't have lost the house if you were a better God. If you run your universe right, we wouldn't be having this. I'm going to tell you something. Listen to Dr. Mark. If you don't hear anything else all night, will you hear this? Many people believe life is good and God is bad. Listen to me. Life can be tough. I, I'm, I never jerk people around from the pulpit. I'm not, I'm not saying what you're facing isn't tough. I don't know where you are. I don't know what you're dealing with. I'm not saying it isn't tough. What I'm saying is life can be hard, but God is good. God is good. Above all things, above all things, the cure for self-pity is worshiping a good God. That's what the scripture says. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, but I will praise him. When things are good, I will praise him. When things are tough, I will praise him. When I'm in a cave hiding out, I will praise him. When I, my life is threatened, I will praise him. When I'm blessed and prospered and driving a luxury car, I will praise him. Not because I deserve it or got what I needed, but I will praise him because God is a God of goodness and abundance. But if I'm... If I'm living in a public housing unit with arthritis in my fingers so bad it hurts me to pop beans, I'm still going to praise him. I'm still going to praise him. Come on, let's sing this. Do you remember this chorus? 
whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether it's worship, whether it's a wonderful moment or whether it's a desert, I'm still going to praise him. Let's stand up on our feet and Blessed worship the Lord. The Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the glorious name. We say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. You give and take away. Come on, let's sing it out. We say, You give and take away. up just like this and I, I, I want to lead you in a play you know in a prayer of faith will you let me lead you just keep your eyes open and look up toward God I know God is not up up but he's above us lift your hands up and lift your eyes and say blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be the name of the Lord when things are good when I don't see goodness I will still worship you you are a good God a generous God, a loving God, no matter what, I will still worship you. And I will not feel sorry for myself. I will not live in self-pity, but I will walk in victory. I'm not afraid of Jezebel. I'm not wallowing in the, uh, in the spirit of entitlement, but I am walking in worship because you're a good God. God bless you, everybody. Good night. God bless you.